afternoon everybody and um, welcome and greetings from the Isle of Butte and uh, off the west coast of Scotland yeah I hope you're all safe and uh, and getting on with productive things during this lockdown time so um, we're very excited about this webinar great thanks to Guy and Riz and Stavros for um, agreeing to put it together um, it's supported by Southern Implants of course and it's a topic right up our street so but of course we're very pro-choice and we have implants to suit every occasion. So um, Guy and Riz will be talking really about atrophic maxilla and the treatment options there um, to do with nasalis and zygomas. They both, um, I think neither of them need introduction in the UK and, and beyond as well. They've been doing, uh, providing these treatments for oh, 15 plus years, the zygomatics and the nasalis and, um, you know, real experts in the field. And Stavros, these little introduction are they? You know, he's he is Mr. Bone, Mr. Bone Builder, and um, and the the approach the approaches he's going to be talking about really um, are doing um, providing these treatments with regular implants and with lots of bone grafting. Um, so both very well accepted ways, different approaches, and of course um, it depends on what the clinician. Uh, wishes to do and what he feels is most appropriate. But we have, um, of course, the range of implants and componentry to support either way um, in treating these patients. So uh, you're very welcome, everybody. And without any further ado, I think, Riz, are you starting? I'm starting, yeah. Are you starting? Right. So I'll hand over to Riz um, and then we'll go to Guy and then to Stavros. Okay. Welcome everybody. I just wanted to uh, introduce myself. I'm Riz. Um, what we're going to talk about today is nasalis to start off with. Um, let me just put the, the screen up there. I hope ever, everybody can see that. I hope everybody's staying safe. I know it's been a, been a difficult time adjusting to spending time at home and I thought we'd make something more productive. So we've put this together with two of my obviously colleagues here. We're going to talk about um, full arch cases, atrophic maxilla. Uh, I'll start off by talking about nasalis, which I tend to use quite a lot of. I'll go through the history, a brief history about uh, all on fours, and then we'll carry on with uh, nasalis, how that helps to do full arch cases, and then go to zygomas, and then finish off with stuff. So we'll have questions at the end, as a panel we'll, we'll answer. So the reason why I call it an all on X is because the all on four concept has been modified, I think, if bone is available, four is not necessarily the, the number that we, we generally look at. It depends on uh, what we can achieve by placing more implants if we have the room. Help is based on the fact that we've got just about enough bone to place four implants angled distally so we can get a better AP spread. Um, so let's take you through the history. I mean, it's been around a long time. So I've been doing it all along. started to become more popular. We have a lot of data behind it. We know it's a successful treatment provided that we follow certain protocols. Um, we've got, uh, when we, we have a look, and the reason for us having an implant is to get a distal spread. Now, if we have the bone available, in this case here, for example, we've planned the case. If you look at where the distal implants are, we're coming out around about the, the first molar region which for the first temporary bridge is absolutely fine. So we're not going to cantilever off the first bridge. We place after four or five months, we can then add an extra tooth on the back to give us a, a, well, in this case, maybe a six to six or a seven to seven spread, which is perfectly adequate to restore an upper arch. And one of the reasons why we're doing this is a lot of patients are now, they don't want a transition zone where they're having a denture. We know we have failing teeth and we're trying to preserve the bone that they have left. Um, for the grafting procedure. Planning wise, for example, in a case like this, where we're planning our implants, we're planning it more palatally. We actually look at the distal implants there, we're coming around about the sixth region, and so we can then translate into surgical time. And within the space of a few hours, load the patient with a temporary bridge 
our technician remember is always on site to make the bridge um, and the surgical time normally takes about an hour and a half two hours to do the surgery the pick up and then do the, the fitting of the bridge the reason why we do like the spread remember when we talk about ap spread we're looking at the anterior implant we're looking at the posterior implant and we know that with that distance between the two implants we can cancel it one and a half times back from the distal implant now that's a standard all on four case but a lot of the cases that we're seeing now especially when uh, me and Guy will travel around a lot and we see these sort of cases they are very atrophic maxilla so either they've had an all on four before which we know that with the lifespan of these implants especially when uh, we see things failing we have to redo these cases when we do redo the cases we're now ending up in a position where we have a lack of bone a lack of bone means that we have to look at alternate treatments and i think the reason why we both use in stavros as well we use the southern implants is because we have a whole range of implants that we can use and whether that's the nasalis or whether that's the zygoma um, we have a, a, an implant for every every situation so let's look at anatomical considerations. Now, we split this up into three types of zones. So we have zone one, which is the anterior zone, um, the zone two and zone three. And that's kind of the spread of uh, bone that we look at. Now, if there is enough bone within these zones, then we can place our uh, standard implants, we can uh, parallel implants. We don't have to angle implants. But if then we go to a situation where we only have bone in zone one and zone two, then we have to look at increasing the AP spread. And the only way we're going to do that is by either sinus grafting or, or in this case here, we're going to uh, um, distalize the, the implant. Then we have a look at situations where we have only bone in zone one, where we're seeing a lot more growth. And then we have to look at alternatives where we can do zygomatic implants or we can look at nasalis implants. Sometimes we have very little bone in zone one, and then we have to look at quad zygomas, which is a guy will touch on briefly, but we're not going to talk too much about it in this presentation. So standard all on four case, these are just x-rays I want to show you that regarding when we have different types of situations. The zygomas, again, you can see that we've re reached a good AP spread just based on doing zygomatic implants. The extreme cases, we're looking at quad zygomas. And again, these are the type of patients that we're seeing who want immediate load. So these are all immediate load cases. Of course, there's situations where if we can do sinus grafting, younger patients, which uh, Stavros will talk about later on, these younger patients, do we go to a quad zygomas or do we go to zygomas? Not necessarily. We can look at bone building, we can look at doing sinus grafting and then delay the treatment and go for maybe a four or five months later option of placing implants, again, loading it later on and therefore, if anything does happen, we can always fall back on zygomes or we can fall back on uh, nasalis. So here's an example of a nasalis case. Now it's interesting to see here, when you look at that, we've got a very good spread. It's like a traditional all on four. The only difference is that we've just gone slightly distal with our implant um, and we've grafted the sinus. And again, it's an immediate load case. That's where the current situation of where the sinus was. And you can see that what we've done is move the sinus out of the way. We've placed the implant slightly more distal to give us a better spread. If we were going for traditional implants um, uh, and angled all on four without doing the nasalis case, we'd be looking at placing our implants in this zone here. And just by looking at that zone, you can see that we've reduced our spread of uh, an AP spread and therefore reduced the overall prosthesis. So this is the uh, nasalis implant that we use. It has a, it's an IBT, so it's a four millimeter body. The apex is very narrow. Um, and again, it's an angled head. It's a 24 degree angled head, which means that we can put straight multi-units. The whole idea of us putting, using angled implants, which are angled um, not with the multi-unit, but with the head itself of the implant, is that we can place straight multi-units. And I think that's very important. And myself and Guy who travel around a lot, a lot of the issues that we used to have with angled implants or with angled multi-units is that after a while they do become loose. Now with the straight multi-unit, we can talk that down to 35 or 40 newton centimeters, which means it's one abutment one time, it doesn't become loose. Now, if an abutment does become loose, a restorative dentist can actually tighten that back down because there's no position to put that back into. It's just a straight tightening down. And I think that's, that's a key. We see a lot of problems with angled multi-units, which can only be talked down to 15 or maximum 20. And when they do become loose, either the prosthesis is loose 
and they can fracture during the healing phase of the first three to four months. So if we look at a, a situation here where we have inadequate bone height posterior to the canine region with a large um, auxiliary sinus, the apex of the implant is anchored into the anterior sinus wall and to the nasocortical bone. That's where we're going to get our primary fixation. We're going to get almost like a bicortical fixation off that implant, which allows us then to do an immediate load. We do need a longer implant, um, and therefore 20 to 25 degree, uh, 20 to 25 millimeter implants are what's needed. Now, the implant itself, it goes through the sinus cavity. Some people talk about in the past, we're going through the sinus without actually moving the sinus back. If we can move the sinus back, I prefer that because we're keeping the sinus lining intact. We're reducing the problems with any sinus issues. And therefore we can, we're allowed, we can then graft that area, which in my opinion, I think is important to graft. The drilling sequence. Now we start off with a two millimeter twist drill um, and I'll show you extra, um, some pictures as we go along. We probe so we know the depth gauge of uh, how deep we want the implant to be. We follow it with the next drill, which is either 3.4 or 3.3. Um, and the implant is then placed in that position. Now, in this sequence here, they say, what if you have three millimeters of bone, you don't have to graft, or, or you, you choose not to. If you have less than that, you graft. Now, that's quite important because if we're doing an immediate load, in my opinion, I think you need to have at least two to three millimeters of cortical bone, of, of crestal bone. That will give us an initial stability there. And then, as we're angling the implant in and locking into the nasal bone, we have bone there as well. So we're going to have bicortical fixation. Anything less than that, you can still do the procedure, but I don't think it's a case for immediate load. And that's come from my own experience where I've tried to push the boundaries and I've had an issue with an implant placed in a very little crystal bone, which is then had to, when we, I then had to remove and go back in. And it made me realize that that is the key and that's my kind of limit when I look at CT scans. So an example here is if you can see in this picture here, we, we've raised the nasal floor which is what I like to do. I like to raise the nasal floor and probe. And it gives me an idea of where that bone is. Then I like to create a small window. The key thing here is also is to maintain the bone at the crest. So don't create a large window because you want to maintain the integrity of that bone. The bone has to be wide enough as well. And one of the reasons that you can decide when you look at the criteria of whether to use nasalis or not, one I've talked about is having two to three millimeters of crustal bone. The second thing is looking at the width of that bone. The width has to be adequate enough to place a four millimeter implant. If that bone is very thin, automatically you can either talk about then doing grafting or go for a zygoma. So that's the criteria that I suppose the guy I'm sure looks at the same thing as well. The thinner that bone is, the more we're considering doing zygomatic implants to give us a better spread. If that bone is adequate enough, then it's fine. Also, it's an angled implant, so what we've got to be careful of is that we countersink the implant slightly. So the back of that bone where we're drilling has to be reduced a little bit more. The window is kept short and the, that integrity of the bone is kept intact. That's the crystal bone that I'm looking at, the height. That's the angle of the implant, and that's very important as well, because the higher up you place the implant at the apex, the thinner the bone's going to get. As we know, the wall closer to the uh, crestal bone um, near the nasal side is wider. The higher up we go towards the nasal bone, the thinner it gets. So we try not to angle the implant too high up. That's the position we don't want. We want to keep it slightly more uh, lower just to get into that uh, most amount of bone there. Now, an example is when we go to the zygoma implant here. And the reason why I've chosen a zygoma implant in this case here is because the bone here is very thin. There is no way we can get a, a four millimeter implant into that. And also the actual crystal height is very small. So we turn, we choose a zygoma. So there's an example I've mapped out where the nasal, the nasal sinus is, the window I've created, the crystal bone where it is, and you can see the implant direction there is going into a thick part of bone. So we know just, just by looking at that image there that we're going to get very good prime stability. And this stability could be above 50 Newton centimeters. To graft, I do graft, this is an ethos graft case. You can see the nasalis implant has been placed. We have a nice spread. And in this case, I've placed the uh, ethos graft, but there are alternatives as well, which I'll show you in the, in the next few slides. 
So here's an interesting case for, for a nasalis implant. And you can see, if I show you the scan here, as we're going through the bone, you can see that we have a lot of issues with the teeth that are remaining. We have a lot of lesions there. We have bone loss around the apex of a lot of these teeth. Now, it was a case which I was deciding on whether to do a zygoma or nasalis, but if we're planning this case, there is enough bone to place the nasalis away from those lesions and do immediate bone. The patient was desperate, didn't want to wear a denture, and therefore we were deciding on, can we place the implants and do an immediate load? That's our planning, which is away from the, um, the apex of those teeth, away from any of the lesions. Um, and looking at that, we can achieve good primary stability. So let's see that in reality. So again, razor flap, when we look at the nasal floor, probe, we have a look at where that nasal floor is. This is important as well, to create the window, the way I've changed my, my um, technique uh, over time now is to actually score the area that I want to go, the angle that I want to place the implant in. Rather than create a large uh, window, lateral window, and then look at where I want to be, it's nice to see from the point I want to start on the crestal ridge to the nasal bone, which I've already lifted, I know that that's my angle of the implant. Now, just by looking at that, I can create a window so I can follow that path and I know whether I'm going off or I'm following the same path that I've actually planned on the CT scan. And there I can visualize it. It's very easy for me to see where I'm going. And I think, again, that's the key. This is not a technique where you have to just raise a small window, a uh, small flap. I think you have to raise the flap enough for you to visualize your angle of where you're going. In the beginning, we try to be quite conservative, but we realize that we can go off and we can go higher up. This way, I know that bone is exactly where I want it to be and I can get stability. And just by looking at that, you can see how that implant's going to be quite a stable implant. There's the uh, nasalis implant. And you can see that as we're going in, we can talk that in for a very high talk. Again, same on the other side. So this is going to be a nasalis case on both sides creating a window, following the pattern of where we want to go. And you can see the implants are sitting nicely within that window and the sinus is sitting well behind that. And looking at that, you can see again, with the crestal ridge, the width of it, that implant is sitting fine. There's plenty of buccal bone, which will keep that bone intact. Now in this case here, we used uh, autogenous bone here. We've just packed that over the top, which I think is a nice thing to do. So we're sa sandwiching that implant there. And we know that we're going to have bone all the way around. So as that heals, we're going to have a nice thick bone surrounding the whole implant. Long, it's a long-term proof. Now, the other thing is with this sort of technique, on relatively younger patients, I don't think we're doing a disservice to the patient. I think if anything does happen with those implants in the future, our next option will always then be zygoma. So we're almost future-proofing this patient now to say that, okay, we've gone from failing teeth to having... Uh, implants placed, which are the nasalis. And if something happens in the future, 15, 20 years down the line, we can always go to zygoma. And also, bearing in mind a lot of these cases, and I know Costa showed a case uh, on Monday or Tuesday, which is beautiful cases. He was doing using the inverter case, um, placing these implants and doing an FP1 type bridge. A lot of the cases we see are FP3 type bridges because they've already got a lot of bone loss. And you can see from the x ray there, we've got a really nice spread. Now, with the inverter, with a new uh, implant that's added to the southern collection, I think this is a very clever implant, works well on most cases. This is a hybrid case. So on one side, we're doing the zygoma, which Guy will talk about in more detail. Um, create a lateral window. This is the implant that is, uh, is being placed. You can see the sinus is, uh, is well away. It's intact, which is important. The other thing is we've kept the crestal bone around the zygoma implant on that side. Um, and you can see the position because it's a 55 degree coax, we can, we've got it in the right position. Again, a straight multi-unit will go on that. There we're using a, an inverter implant. And you can see on that side, we have a zygoma on one side and nasalis on the other. And I'll show you the x-ray, which will give you a better idea. Now, I'm quite surprised by looking at that, the inverter on the left hand side is actually very distal, we're almost at the back of the distal of the six or the seven region. Now, people always say, Well, that must be very difficult to get in. In this case, it was, it was quite straightforward. They didn't struggle putting that implant in, even though it's 
very distant, it was actually, the mouth opening was quite good. And I generally, I don't tend to think that we struggle with placing an implant that far back. But you can see also looking at this x-ray that we've engaged into the cortical bone, which for any sort of technique with a media alone, whether it's going to be an all-in four, whether it's going to be an artist, or any type of implant that we do in the media extraction and placement on a single tooth, in, in engaging into the cortical bone would give us the primary stability. Here's a hybrid, another hybrid case where we've done lasalis on one side, zygoma so on the other. We've used a max implant on one side and we've used anterior implants as well. And again, that's a final frame that the patient can be wearing. And we've got a very good spread without going into too much grafting. Go through another case here where it's quite an interesting case where the patient was wearing a denture. I hated the idea of wearing a denture. And again, we wanted an immediate load. We look at the planning, we can plan exactly where we want to go. We can see we've got plenty of bone at the apex and the crestal side of that. This is the plan, you can see where it's going through the sinus, so we know that we can move the sinus back and graft that area. So again, like we do, we raise the nasal floor. Now, not everybody wants to, not everybody has to raise the laser floor. In my opinion, I like to do that because I like to feel where the implant is to make sure I'm not too far into the nasal sinus. And again, we don't want to perforate that as well. Bone scrapers, I think, are very important. Rather than waste that bone, we use bone scrapers. Collects lots of bone, gives us a nice volume of bone. Now, whether you mix that with whatever you decide to do, whether it's ethos or whether it's going to be um, pure autogenous or a mixture with a xenograph, that's entirely up to you. And you can see how much bone we can collect just by using the bone scraper. So again, raise the sinus for the implant. And we tend to start, and this is where you can't see, but we can start slightly palatal. And we don't over prep the uh, crestal bone, but you can't under prep it too much either because you don't want to put too much stress on that cortical bone. Now, as we place the implant, you can see we use our surgical stand. We're always going to use surgical stands, we always will, because this gives us an idea of where we are, whether we need to change the position. Because remember, as we rotate the implant around, because it's the 24 degree coax, we can get it into the position that we desire. We don't mind it slightly being, it being slightly distalized, it doesn't have to be absolutely straight. But as long as it's within the bony envelope, uh, the prosthetic envelope, that's important. PRGF. Uh, and I know, I think Stavros and Guy will talk about that later on, but um, I like to use PRGF as a, uh, as a membrane over the top to cover that area. Obviously, people have different opinions for that. And you can see just by looking at that, we can see we've got a very nice spread. Again, an immediate load case, but you can see we've got a very nice uh, AP spread just by placing the Manzalis implants. Again, within the uh, prosthetic envelope, you always need to check that. And you can see the bridge is very thin. As an immediate node bridge, the bridge is very thin. The positions of those implants are coming out nicely. And the patient was very happy, immediate load, and this is the spread that we've achieved using the Nazarbis implants. And that's the uh, final x-ray with the uh, final prosthesis on. There you go, happy patient, immediate load patient with final restorations. Here's some journal. There's some, um, we have different types of journals. We have uh, Antistory, we have uh, the Malo Clinic, and, and Jensen. These are the papers that I normally refer to, looking at immediate loads um, and atrophic cases, transcyanus, as people call it. Um, so if people want to read more about it, these are the papers I'd recommend. So, in conclusion, I'd like to say that. You know, nasalis should be, I don't think it's for a lot of the guys out there who are doing immediate loads um, for large cases. I think it's an implant that should be considered. Um, and I know there's a whole, um, it's becoming popular to do sinus, uh, to do zygomas as a, as a treatment of choice. But I think this is a step in between the two. And I think it really should, provided the protocols are followed, it can work out very well. And like I said, it gives you a fallback later on to do zygoma treatments. But I definitely think it's worth considering. So 
we'll take questions at the end, but uh, I hope that's been useful. And I'll now hand over to, uh, to Guy. If I can. Okay, thanks very much, Riz. Okay, just get to the stop share if I can. There you go, over to you, Guy. Okay, thank you. Right, okay, let's start things off. Okay, first of all, thanks very much, Riz, Riz for that excellent uh, presentation. So, <coughs> sorry, uh, Corona cough there. Um, what I'm going to do is run through the, um, uh, the, the, the next level. In other words, what, what our next options are beyond uh, nasars and maybe beyond pterygoids. So, as a quick refresher, the bone zones that Riz has already mentioned, I think this is a useful classification because um, the anatomy of the patient dictates our treatment options. Um, now, what we're going to be looking at is people in that, uh, uh, on that bottom level of the screen there, where they've only got bone in zones one. So we're able to get normally two, three, sometimes even four implants in that anterior section. So in other words, from canine to canine. And then we're looking at placing zygomatic implants. Uh, our other options obviously would be uh, pterygoids perhaps, uh, if there was sufficient bone. Often these are Atrophic cases have little bone in that area. Uh, the other option we would have is sinus grafting. Um, obviously, if we're going to graft the area, uh, we'd be looking at delayed uh, loading on and delay, probably delayed placement as well. So let's uh, have a look. Uh, the next classification uh, is specific to zygomatic implants. So this was proposed by Carlos Aparicio, the so-called Zargo classification. And again, it's an anatomical based solution uh, for deciding where we're going to place our implants. And just to run through the five types that we have here, we've got the type zero, which involves a flat maxillary wall, or sometimes even convex. And the main body of the zygomatic implants will pass through the sinus cavity. The type two, uh, sorry, type one, is a slightly concave uh, maxillary wall. And on this one, the implant body will uh, have a combined approach of partly intra sinus and partly extra sinus. In type 2, again, similar trajectory and pathway, but this time more of the body is extra sinus rather than intra sinus. And then finally, types 3 and types 4 follow an extra maxillary pathway, so in other words, outside of the sinus. Uh, this will be considered a more advanced technique, which has its own special risks involved with implant placement. The, um, my talk today is going to mainly focus on the types of zero to type two. Um, so, let's move on. so the technique which I'm going to be describing is the uh, modification of James Chow's original procedure, and it's named intramaxillary extra science approach. So in other words, the implant is going to be running within the confines of the maxilla. However, it's going to be running outside the sinus to try to avoid sinus complications. So let's explain that in a little bit more detail. Uh, so this is our situation where, and the trajectory we want to place our uh, zygomatic implant. We can see that if we want our implants to be coming out in the ideal position, in other words, on the crest, so it's ideal for prosthetics, uh, then we've got a very thin amount of bone in the crestal region and very little area uh, is available before we go into the sinus. Um, I think this is a real crucial area for both the short term and, and the long term. Uh, essentially, by putting an implant through this, we create an open portal between the oral cavity and the sinus cavity. Now, obviously in time, this can cause problems either initially in the initial post-operative healing period or over time with uh, long-term sinus complications. So if we can, we want to try and avoid perforating that sinus membrane. Uh, the original Branamark um, uh, protocol would be going from a more palatal position uh, and we'd just be going through almost uh, ig ignoring the sinus itself. Um, so we know that in time this can cause complications, so if we can, we want to try and avoid this. You could also place the implant more buccally um, in order to try and avoid going through the sinus. However, this again presents other complications. And again, I'll, I'll touch on this briefly a little bit later on. 
so this is our ideal positioning from our planning uh, where we've got the uh, the head of the implants coming out on the mid portion of our crest so it's an ideal prosthetic um, position and all of our treatment needs to be prosthetically driven so in other words we need to think about the final restoration we're going to be doing we want to ensure that our implants are placed in such a position that our restorative dentists are, are happy with us so the the technique uh, essentially making a, a, an extended lateral window in the maxillary wall, in fracturing that window and then pushing in the bone in order to protect and maintain the integrity of the sinus where possible. So that's what we're aiming for. I'll run through it uh, with a couple of cases and just uh, run through some of the tips and, and how I get around some of the uh, various complications. So this is the case that I just showed you. Um, so. Um, we'll um, cut an extended lateral window in the lateral maxillary wall and then this bit of bone will be infractured and the lateral window is kept in place so in other words it forms a new medial wall to our implant. The implant is then positioned as you can see, nice thick crest here and again if you look at the bone on the buccal aspect to the dental implant, uh, the zygomatic implant, it gives good support so the, the risk of getting long-term recession, exposure of threads with that nice thick bone there is very unlikely in this case. However, we've not got a huge amount of bone around our implant. It's engaged nicely into the zygoma itself. So um, again, I'll describe a little bit more, but this is a uh, technique which I've been developing. It's a, called the sandwich technique. In other words, we're going to sandwich bone graft in around our uh, implant itself. And then I'm going to place a membrane over the top of that to protect the graft material and try to um, reduce any risk of exposure of the implant itself. So it's sitting nicely within the confines of the maxilla, but outside of the sinus. And again, we can see as we go ahead to closure. Um, again, another thing to focus on here is the keratinized mat uh, material, the keratinized tissue that we need around our implant. And again, I think this is extremely important to the long-term stability of these implants, of any implants, to be honest, but uh, even more so with zygomatic implants. Uh, and we can see that uh, the implants are nicely positioned within the prosthetic envelope. So restorative, we're happy that the position is nicely on the crest of the ridge for those zygomatic implants. Uh, often zygomas are quoted as being anything from seven to 11 millimeters too far palatally. I think that's maybe not a, a fault of the implant itself. I think it's more probably a fault of the surgeon placing them and maybe, maybe the knowledge. And hopefully we've moved on now that uh, Zygomatic implants are very much more aesthetically and prosthetically driven by their placement. Uh, this is the post-operative x-ray of this patient. Uh, again, we've used uh, easy bar laser welded there to provide some cross arch stability for the initial prosthesis. And again, if we can uh, take a CT scan of this, uh, approximately a year down the line, we can see nice bone encasing the whole length of this implant. Again, there's good buccal bone at the coronal area. So reduce the risk of recession and exposure of, of implant threads. And also you can see the nice, clean, healthy um, sinus there. So nice dark sinus. So we've got an implant completely separate from the um, sinus itself, encased in good bone. So how, how important is the sinus and the zygomatic implant insertion? Uh, let's look at some papers. And there's a wealth of papers out there, um, many uh, producing figures from as low as a couple of percent or maybe even no percent, right up until um, Mallow produced a paper in 2008 saying 22.2% uh, of patients suffer from sinus symptoms. Now, um, in interesting enough with that, with that paper itself, um, it was actually using an extra maxillary approach for the implant placement. So even with extra maxillary, I think we still have to be concerned about possibility of, of sinus issues. My only experience is that um, Sinus issues is, is the biggest nightmare. It's, it's why I've, you know, the implants integrate, they all work, they all work fantastically well. Very rarely do we get an implant that fails to integrate. However, uh, an integrated implant with a chronic sinusitis that's persistent is a really, really difficult patient to look after. Hence why I've developed this uh, technique. And this is what we don't want to be seeing. Uh, zygomatic implants placed uh, via the older technique, you can see that because they're a little bit more palatal. They were placed by myself, so I'm not going to criticise the placement. Um, but we've got this long-term chronic sinusitis going on. Uh, very difficult to treat <clears throat> and uh, always treatment complications is, is always your 
biggest issue. I think if we can try and avoid complications, that's always going to be the ideal way. Uh, at this stage, referring to an ENT colleague to try and open up the osteomyelitis complex is a possibility. Uh, sinus washouts, maybe even long-term antibiotics, and again, uh, sinus douches. So uh, we can try and keep these patients going, but it's it's a difficult patient to look after. So um, uh, how how do we avoid these sinus complications? Uh, as I was just alluding to just a moment ago, uh, and it's the same for any aspect of dentistry. Uh, prevention is always easier than treatment. So uh, a lot of it is predetermined in our preoperative assessment. So we want to take and become familiar with taking sinus histories from our patients. Um, these are the main points that I've listed here in terms of discharges, in terms of loss of smell. Uh, there's a very appropriately named um, SNOT20 test. I think it's been superseded by uh, even more SNOT apparently. Um, however, um, you know, I wouldn't really expect us as dentists to go through that. It's a um, completely subjective test, so it doesn't really give us any history, but I think we need to uh, decide, is this patient an, an at-risk patient? There's other risks as well, of course. Uh, heavy smokers uh, are more likely to get a sinus size. People with, uh, again, histories of uh, uh, acute bacterial rhinosinusitis or chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, we, have to be a, we have to be careful with. I'm not saying we shouldn't proceed with, but we want to be extremely careful. And we want to maybe think about which techniques we're going to be using in patients with a history of sinusitis. Um, and again, um, I'm sure we're all becoming more and more familiar with uh, interpreting CT scans. Uh, as we ex ever expand the field of view of our scans to encompass zygomas, we have to ensure that we also are reporting those fields of view. Um, so we may be able to report some aspects ourselves, but we also rely on maxillofacial radiologists or general radiologists to, to give us opinion on the, the field of view that we are, we're examining. Uh, it's definitely important to be able to recognize simple issues, so uh, such, as, such as mucosal thickening, uh, getting used to looking at the osteomyelitis complex, it's a very important area, uh, and taking advice where necessary. Uh, this can be classified further via the Lund McKay system, which I'm, I'm not going to fully go into, um, but Stephanie Carlos Aparicio, in terms of his post operative uh, criteria for success, uses this. So, um, again, I think it's something that we should look into as, as surgeons. Uh, where necessary, ENT referral. It's always better to um, make ENT referral preoperatively rather than postoperatively. I don't think an ENT surgeon is ever going to give us a rubber stamp to say it's okay to proceed. But I think it's important that uh, uh, we make the referral beforehand. It's always much harder to make a referral afterwards to, to ENT. So again, I'd, I'd stress finding a good ENT surgeon who is familiar with dental implants and who's happy uh, with looking after uh, these cases. Um, if anyone needs advice of people who, who they want to refer to in around the London area, they're both Riz and myself know some, some good ENT colleagues so we can do that. Um, so let's just uh, look at a couple more cases. Uh, I just want to try and re-emphasize some of the techniques that I've talked about. Um, so uh, again, a case with some failing teeth, periodontally involved, uh, losing the remaining five teeth in a couple of roots, um, patient wanting immediate load. Now we know uh, anteriorly, very commonly, we've got good bone and it's in this slightly palatal area where we find bone. Um, there's not much around the upper left lateral, but otherwise we've got enough bone to place implants in the anterior section. So zone one is, is good for bone. Uh, posterior to that, there's very little bone. and There's no bone in the pterygoids either in this case. So the option is two anteriors and then two zygomatic implants. Uh, to make things a little bit more interesting, you can see there's a, on the left hand screen there, there's a septum in the sinus, uh, which makes it a little bit trickier. You'll see that when I, I raise the sinus in a few minutes. Um, but the pathway is, is probably a Zaga 1, isn't it? Uh, so you're, you're mainly intrasinus uh, with a little bit through the sinus wall. So again, I'm going to deflect the sinus lining on this one to try and keep everything intact. So what I'm going to do is go through a, a series of, of videos now. So, where have I can? Can you still hear me? Okay, as I drop the volume down. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we're going to collect bone with a safe scraper, and again, you can collect a reasonable amount. Uh, nowadays, I'm also going to, especially if we're doing a double arch, I'll go down to the uh, external oblique ridge, the mandible, and take extra bone there, either in the form of a, a safe scrape or maybe even. Um, 
uh, taking out some little discs of, of bone and crushing them up. And we want to try and achieve a 50-50 bone mix with a mix with a biomaterial. And again, I'll show that a little bit more. I'm now going to cut a lateral window into the lateral maxillary wall. And again, when I'm doing this, I'm, I'm ensuring that I'm not cutting all the way through onto the sinus lining. It's really important to take our time here not to damage the sinus lining, uh, because I think that's key to getting a good successful implant. It does mean it takes a little bit longer, but again, uh, I think it's giving a much better long-term success rate. So that's the initial window cut going almost to the uh, alveolus and then out until um, we start reaching the zygomatic prominence of the um, of, uh, maxilla itself. Uh, so then um, there's a technique that I use and there's many different ways, uh, whether using piezo. Uh, I find that it's much safer just to tap through the last bit. Um, and um, on this one, I think I'll just point out in a minute, there's a little vessel running through. Um, normally I'm able to preserve these vessels uh, using this technique. And uh, on the patient's right hand side here now, I'm going to hit a little bit harder just because there's a um, scepter there. Um, normally you're lucky and it will, will split, okay. Uh, so we just freed everything up nicely there. Um, Next thing, I'm going to spend a bit of time very carefully lifting uh, the um, sinus lining out of, of the maxilla itself to try and create a nice pathway so that I've got the bone sitting on the sinus wall there, which is going to protect the sinus lining when I'm drilling in a minute, you'll see. Uh, and also be very careful, particularly around this um, coronal section, so going into the alveolus. This is the bit where you want to spend quite a bit of time. In general, I find, same as sinus grafting, if it's a trickier case, make a slightly bigger window so it makes your sinus elevation a little bit easier. Uh, now, <clears throat> because we're used to drilling dental implants with normal drills, I tend to prepare, prepare the alveolus uh, just using normal drills as I would do for, for normal implant placement. Um, if the bone is reduced and softness area, uh, I quite like going to versa burrs at this stage. Uh, and they're very safe in terms of avoiding damage in sinus underneath. And it just compresses and condenses any available bone that we do have. Uh, we're now going to go in with the uh, long round bar. I'm, I'm basically using this to, to make sure I can get good access to, to get my position right into uh, the lower part of the zygoma. Sometimes it's not possible to do it with this straight handpiece. Uh, so this is a 20 to 1. Um, talk straight handpiece, the old zygoma uh, drills. Um, if access is difficult, I'll swap over to a contra-angled handpiece at this stage. I'm just going to uh, mark and just uh, score through the underside of the um, cortical bone there. We then move on to the twist drill. And uh, so now I'm going to push the twist drill into position. And uh, all the time, you can see it's, it's really nice, clear, easy uh, visual access. So there's no risk about me putting this zygoma into the patient's orbit, uh, or there's no risk about me losing control. I can see exactly uh, where the tip of the drill is going. And you see it just punch through the outer cortical plate there. You need to make sure you engage the cortical plates. You need to just pop out the outside, hence why I've got that reverse Langenbeck's in there, just uh, protecting the soft tissue as it pops through. Uh, next thing is we're going to measure uh, the length. So it's a neat little measuring device. And on this one, we're going to use a, a 40 millimeter. This is the Zygan implant. So uh, very, very neat implant. So it's got a textured rough surface to the um, apical threads, which is going to be engaging into the bone. And then uh, a smooth section in, in the middle, uh, in case you get any exposed threads. doesn't rub over the air. Um, because it's narrow apex, it pushes in quite nice and easily. So we're going to drive the implant in and the machine set on 35 centimeters. So uh, that's me get my minimal stability. So as you can see, I've got still quite a long way to go and we've already got a really nice um, uh, stability there. So with the apical tip of this implant, I want to drive it so it's just, just popping through the outer cortex. We don't want to go too far out because this can cause some friction on the outside. And on occasion, I've had a couple of cases where uh, this can cause some irritation and even cause a small um, sinus on the, on the cheek, which necessitates going back in and doing an apisectomy of the zygomatic implant. 
which is not that uh, fun or particularly easy to do. Um, so now we want to think about our restorative dentists. So uh, we want to make sure we're getting our position of our implants as close as we can to the ideal prosthetic position. So we're just going to adjust the angulation. That screw, um, the screwdriver's positioned on the screw axis hole. So we know exactly where the implant is going to be coming out, the multi units going to be coming out. Uh, and just about maybe see there the, the tip of the, the implant just popping through. So that's pretty much spot on position there. Uh, as you can see, the sinus lining hasn't been damaged either. Uh, the bone is still in place. Uh, and we go ahead. Um, and now I'm going to put my multi unit on, straight multi unit on. As we say, we talk that down to 35 newton centimeters. Take a small tissue punch just so I can get a nice position. And uh, then we go through the closure. So again, going back to the, as Riz mentioned, the one abutment, one time principle. Um, if we can, we don't want to remove that abutment. So we want to talk it down in the ideal position. Um, for me, back in this, in this time, I was using uh, uh, ma mainly PRGF with bone safe scrapings. Uh, I've now slightly changed things. I'm adding a biomaterial in and trying to get a 50-50 mix with the, um, with the autogenous safe scrapings that we're taking. So we've got live cells in there and also a, a vehicle just to carry things. Um, so I'm packing underneath uh, the implant at this stage. I'll, I'll show you in a minute how I've slightly revised that technique. And then we're going to pack over the top of the implant. So uh, the implant is covered in PRGF with bone and safe scrapings. Um, once we've packed that in place, I'll then take, uh, this is the BTI system. So it's the PRGF. Uh, so you get two fractions. This is the platelet rich fraction mixed with the bone. And then we're going to take the, so it's more of the PRGF of the bone going in there. Uh, and then we get a, um, a, a second uh, uh, fraction, which is uh, fraction one, uh, one, which is uh, we're allowed to make a, a sort of thick, strong membrane. We have to let this set for probably a uh, minimum of at least half an hour to form this nice, thick, uh, tight membrane, um, which we're just going to lay over the top. And see that position there. So I'm just going to lay that over the top. Okay, moving on. So we, we, we close everything up and we can see there we've got a nice position of our implants with good anterior posterior spread. Uh, everything nicely within the prosthetic envelope. Uh, so we're happy to proceed uh, to do our pickups. Um, this is using something called Luxabite, which we're quite keen on. We have the lab on site, uh, so we pull this up immediately. So we're not worried about contraction of this material in that short period of time. Um, we then go ahead and see the initial post-operative uh, x-ray. Um, after one year, we take a follow-up uh, CT scan and we can see the implant nice encased within bone all the way along there. And again, the nice healthy appearance of the sinus, uh, nice black uh, sinus, but no always thickening of the sinus walls. So uh, this implant is uh, within the confines of the maxilla, so in other words, intramaxillary, and then outside of the sinus, so extra sinus. Uh, this is the uh, patient. Yes, it looks I'm going to reset the teeth now. Another thing, I went to a wedding a couple of years ago and my auntie said, is every single picture I'm not smiling? Um, like my mum said, well, now you know why. So, uh, yeah, I'm very, very happy. So, yeah, a good, a good, happy patient. And I think if we look at where we started off with this guy and then uh, where we finished off, I think it was a, a, a very nice change to the person. And, yeah, really has dramatically changed this, uh, transformed this per patient's personality. Um, I'm just gonna finish with one uh, final case here. And I think recently there was a little bit of discussion in some of the, the, the topics about a, a high buckle incision um, or a vestibular incision. For me, when I've got the right amount of mucosa, I'm very happy using this, this incision. Um, so I think it's uh, like anything in dentistry. Again, it's case selection. And also, without doubt, it's technique as well. So I'm just going to run through a case, and this is how uh, I'll be doing most of my zygomas nowadays. So we make a, a high sulcus incision. Um, so uh, just beyond the junction of the uh, uh, keratinized mucosa. Um, and often we can do a, a slight split thickness uh, incision, similar to, not, not too dissimilar to a Lefort one osteotomy, maybe not quite as high as that. Um, 
And then uh, bone, as we talked about earlier, we're collecting via safe scrape. And in this case, I'm mixing with a biomaterial. So 50-50 of um, bone safe scrapings uh, with small granule biowas. Uh, we're mixing it with the fraction two PRGF and you have to leave this for about 10 to 15 minutes. Once you do, you can essentially cut it with scissors and you've got a, uh, a pliable uh, adhesive bone graft that we can use to, once we've done our preparation, we can put this against the bony wall. So before you insert the zygomatic implant, I'll put this bone graft in first, then we'll put the implant in and then we'll place a second bone graft over, over the top. So that's my so-called sandwich technique for the uh, zygomatic implant. So we can see here that the, the, the initial sandwich is placed underneath the implant. The implant then goes in and then we place the graft over the top again. Following that, uh, I'm using this conventional membrane. This is a Creos membrane, uh, Noble Biocare, um, which just goes over the top, um, just laid over the top, not tacked in place and it sits nicely. Um, I'm then going to pull back over the palatal um, mucosa. And you can see here how I've made the tissue punch, a four, four mil tissue punch is perfect for the uh, southern uh, multi-unit abutments. And you can see here, I've probably got at least um, six, seven, eight millimeters of uh, buccal keratinized mucosa, buccal to the implant position. I'll show you in a minute that the implant is placed well, it's not that it's placed uh, palatally. Uh, and again, I think this is the important thing, is taking time with your closure. Same for any bone grafting procedure, meticulous closure. So this PTFE suturing with horizontal mattress sutures in order to avert our wound edges. So we're going to spend a bit of time making sure we've got good closure and then follow up with some interrupted micro sutures. The beauty of this technique is it makes the incision line away from the area where you can take an impression. So it makes for a good uh, impression. Uh, where it doesn't distort or pick up any of the stitches. It also, for a post operatively allows us to keep the site clean with mouthwash. And, and also we can, from a, from a point of view of, of a surgeon, we can observe the tissues to make sure everything is, is healing nicely. Um, and uh, uh, if necessary, we can remove the stitches without the, the need to uh, take the, the bridge off. So we can see then I, I go ahead and carry on the, the, the closure uh, and we can see lots of nice keratinized mucosa around all our implants there. And we go ahead and take our impressions and make our, our bridge work. This is now at the uh, one week review. I thought I'd just include this. So it, it shows nicely how the stitches are sitting up in the buckle there. We can, we can keep them clean. The patient can rinse with mouthwash. Uh, and again, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see uh, how Essentially, our, our end bridge will be nice and, and slim, a nice, slim, thin end bridge, uh, end bridge final prosthesis uh, um, when, we, when we come around to that. So what, what are my uh, key points and the summary of, of, of uh, key points of this technique? I think, uh, obviously, it's important if we can do a lateral window, and this is particularly important in the Zaga 0 and Zaga 1, uh, where we're going to mainly go for a intrasinus approach. So we can leave that window on and protect our sinus lining. Um, what else? Uh, buccal bone. Buccal bone at the coronal aspect of our implant is extremely important. Uh, this is to prevent uh, any recession or exposure of, of our implant threads, which again is a, is a real nightmare. Um, this is particularly important when you think of the implants we might be using. If we've got a polished implant surface, um, maybe with polished threads or maybe no threads at all, like the uh, Zygex, um, if some of the implant becomes exposed, I'm not too concerned about it. However, if we have a super rough uh, implant that becomes exposed to the oral cavity, whether it be a, uh, an eight millimeter implant, a 15 millimeter implant, or even worse, a 45 millimeter implant, I think once you've exposed that rough surface to the oral cavity, you're in, you're in trouble. And we can go there and try and take off threads and try and graft over there. It's a really, really difficult area to, to handle. So if we can keep that buckle bone, let's keep the buckle bone, prevent that recession. Um, grafting and membranes, I've, I've talked a bit about that today and I think that's actually quite important. Uh, what is really important if you're grafting is to ensure that you uh, maintain the integrity of the sinus. And if we do, I'm happy to go ahead and do the so-called sandwich graft so that that bone uh, encases our, our implant for longevity. Um, implant design and surface we talked about a, a little bit but I, I, I think uh, the narrow apex implants, uh, zygomatic implants are particularly useful. It makes the, the drilling process a lot easier. 
um, and literally it's only a few turns to put the implant in as you saw earlier rather than the old days of having to wind the whole implant in slowly through the alveolus so I think that's been a, a big improvement and also the head of the implant the smooth surface as well I think is, is, a, is an added benefit. Uh, one implant, one abutment, one time. Again, I think that's extremely important if we try and avo avoid uh, disturbing abutments and allowing for soft tissue connection. This may be especially important where we've got very limited bone around the coronal aspects of our, of our zygomatic implants. And then finally, we talked about the peri-implant soft tissue. Uh, if we're lucky, we've got lots of keratinized, fantastic. We can go ahead, we can do vestibular incisions, we can do tissue punches. If we haven't, maybe we need to think about different incisions, like a slightly palately orientated incision, where we're going to push some of that cratinized mucosa to the buccal side. Also, we may want to think about things such as um, buccal fat grafts, uh, where we can take the buccal fat tissue over, over, or even the scarf graft, as was uh, described by, again, Carlos Aparicio, a, a very neat uh, um, uh, option just to try and improve. We may also find soft tissue grafting is, is something that we could think about. It's not something that I've been particularly involved in myself, but uh, maybe something to think about. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to, to thank everyone for listening. And uh, obviously, everything is always a team effort. So I'd like to thank the team that work with me. Um, I do very little or none of the restoration myself. So I have an extensive team. And obviously, in particular, um, my, my uh, good friend and business partner, Mike Fuse at uh, Fusion Dental in, in Cardiff uh, for providing uh, all that excellent lab work. So I'd just like to thank you and uh, I think I'm just about ready to hand over to uh, Stavros now. All right. Now let me just um, get things together here. Okay, so um, thank you all for joining us and um, thanks Reason and Guy for these amazing uh, cases that you've shown and the very interesting presentations. My presentation is gonna be slightly different. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the atrophic maxilla and how to approach this by reconstructing and avoiding the use of zygomas and all these amazing implants that we have. Um, so our mission is uh, generally speaking to restore the anatomy, restore function and restore the aesthetics. And um, in, in my mind and in my practice, zygomatic implants are considered as rescue implants. Um, so I tend to um, keep it only for specific cases. People who do zygomatic implants know that it takes uh, good knowledge of the anatomy, a uh, good knowledge of a technique and um, in order to do them properly. And funnily enough, during the last few years, zygomatic implants have become some sort of a macho kind of procedure. And everybody thinks, oh, let's try and do this. Let's try and do that and they tend to keep pushing cases towards that, uh, which is not a bad thing because there are many cases that need those. But uh, the way I see it, um, I would um, uh, talk about zygomatic implants to patients who are older, patients who don't want to uh, have multiple procedures or when multiple procedures must be avoided. Obviously in oncologic cases, post maxillectomy, and when everything else fails. And when I'm talking about older patients, the way I see it, I've got a number in my mind, which is not set in stone. So I, I, I think that around the age of 60 patients, younger than that, I discuss more bone grafts. Patients who are older, I would probably go lean more towards uh, zygomatics. So even under the best circumstances, a number of patients with zygomatic implants do face problems. There's no doubt about that. And implants fail. We know that and we feel that every day. We see that, unfortunately. Uh, 
But what if a zygomatic implant fails on a patient with, with a long life expectancy? All of a sudden that becomes complicated to, to address. You have to go back in, try and find some bone that can hold an implant into the zygoma, or you have to reconstruct the area before you do it. So for younger patients, I go a bit differently. So the treatment options that we have basically is reconstruct the area, restore the anatomy, and then place implants. The treatment sequence that I follow is straightforward. Grafting, and it's always outside the bony envelope, so it has to be done in a specific way. Then healing for at least three, four months, and that depends on the patient, the, the body, the, how the body reacts, and also on the materials that we use. And then we place implants, and sometimes we have to add a bit more, gra more grafting material. Uh, sometimes you have to wait and load uh, after three, four months, or sometimes you can uh, go with immediate loading. I only do immediate loading when there is enough basal native bone that can offer good stability and insertion talks higher than 35 newtons per square centimeter. Uh, that's a bit tricky to achieve sometimes, but with experience, I think it's possible for most cases. And then it's important to avoid compression or pressure on the newly formed bone by our implants or provisionals. Newly formed bone is not the same as trabecular bone or cortical bone. It, it acts and reacts a bit differently to our manipulation. So if we try to go with high insertion torque or we put any pressure on it, we lose it. So the way I do it, the materials that I use are usually allograft and PRF or autogenous bone and Hoori technique. I do not like xenografts for more than one reason, but I'm gonna show you this picture. This is a case that I've done a while ago. And then I opened two years later to fit an implant. And I found this granules of xenograft. And we know the literature has shown that uh, those granules might never turn into bone. And honestly, I wouldn't want my implant to be in contact with that. Bone to implant contact is important. We cannot achieve 100% bone to implant contact, let alone having a large percentage of the, the bone there being uh, these kind of granules. So space maintenance is also very important. We have to give room for the graft to heal without, without any uh, pressure, any compression, any movement. And I use tenting screws, titanium mesh, or the cortical bone plate. When I'm doing, a, when I'm using a titanium mesh, I use this specific system, which is called fast system. And it's basically a titanium plate the holes of the plate have inner threads and those inner threads can be engaged uh, immediately below immediately below the screws there's threads that can engage those holes so we can fit that uh, plate at any height above the bony surface that we want to reconstruct and on the right side you can see um, the cortical plate from the external oblique line for the huri technique you can see both um, means of space maintenance uh, in the mouth. On the left side, you can see the plate, on the right side, the hole. They serve the same purpose, at least in my hands. Then it's important to release extensively. Uh, it's also important to do that in a way which is as less traumatic as possible because we don't want to create more inflammation. We don't want to disrupt the blood supply. And that allows us for a passive and complete tension-free closure. I sometimes use this soft brushing set, but uh, on many occasions, I also use my periosteal elevator with the same approach to achieve the same result.
Now, I rarely use GBR membranes and I suture in two layers because the, the deep the layer of sutures uh, holds the flaps and absorbs all the tension so there is no flap mobility and this allows me to close the, the flap edges uh, passively. You can see here the two layers of sutures, a deep layer, which is a horizontal mattress basically, and the superficial layer. And this is a drawing by my friend Alberto Miselli, which shows basically how I go about doing the horizontal mattress suture. So um, the flaps, uh, I spend some time thinking about the design of my flaps because I want to make sure that the blood supply is going to be as good as it can get. The flaps are going to be, um, I, 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 well, and there's no ideal flap, but uh, I want them to be as good as they can be for each case. And my, my, in my mind, there's two things, blood supply, and I also want to make sure that I will be able to cover the the area without problems. Blood supply to the graft as soon as possible. Well, this is something that I'm going to discuss uh, uh, in a minute or two, because we know that the new neovascularization is key to the outcome. And if there is a way to start the process as soon as possible, the neovascularization, that means that we're gonna have a much better outcome. And there is a way to do it. Biotensegrity. Now, this might be something that most people never heard of. And it has to do with the tension and compression on the cell membranes. I'm gonna explain that a bit further down. And it, again, it has to do with the neovascularization. So we have to take that into consideration as well. Uh, I keep my sutures for four weeks. And the reason is we do know that the periosteum needs several weeks to reattach firmly to the bone. And by removing stitches a couple of weeks after the surgery uh, does not help. Now, biotensegrity was introduced by Dr. Ingber, uh, a physician from Harvard. Uh, basically, it says that positive and negative forces generated at the surface of a cell are transferred to the nucleus through the actomyosin filaments at complex through the cytoskeleton. And there must be a balance between the extracellular and intracellular forces. Uh, there's some research out there discussing the impact of the flap tension on neon geogenesis. And there was uh, experiments on mice showing that stretching the mucosa significantly reduces the amount of VEGF, the vascular endothelial growth factor production, and thus vascular reduction, which leads afterwards to bone loss, lead, at least in this case. The sutures that I use are these specific ones. Um, I like them because they are monofilament and um, they are resorbable. So if, even when I do full arches and I uh, have immediate uh, bridges on, I don't remove them, but they also last for the time that I want them to stay in. I use them in different sizes, depending in thicknesses, depending on what I want to achieve. What about provisionals now? Well, if possible, I would prefer nothing. I wouldn't want to have any kind of uh, provisionals, any kind of pressure on the area. I would like the area to heal without any interference from anything, but sometimes it's not possible. So ideally for abutments nicely spread in the arch, it could be teeth, it could be provis provisional implants or a combination, and then uh, a provisional bridge on top, or it could be a denture with no labial or buccal flange possibly with a short implant. I've tried that with a locator abutment in the mid palate. My go-to biomaterials, allograft, PRF. 
which is used to create sticky bone. And I also use the PRF to create membranes. PRF is part of my routine and I will explain now why. Cases like this, I would never be able to do them if I wouldn't spend either nine, 10 months waiting for my graft to heal and I would end up with xenograft uh, in the grafted material. Uh, or I would need to use autogenous, but this case was done with PRF and allograft. This one too. You can see the lower, X, the x-ray at the lower part of the screen was uh, two years after placement of implants. Again, this would not be possible without the use of autogenous, uh, but I, we, I can achieve the same results with the allograft and PRF. What is PRF? Most of you, if not all of you know that it's naturally derived, derived from the blood. It's a concentrate of white blood cells, platelets and fibrin. The LPRF contains 97 more platelets and 50% more white cells compared to whole blood. And APRF, the one that I use, uh, has increased platelets and neutrophilic granulocytes and growth factors. So it's basically platelets, growth factors essentially, leukocytes and fibrin. We know that there's loads and lots of different types of growth factors in the platelets. Actually, there's more than 150. There's lots of research around them. And uh, we just touched the tip of the iceberg with regards to understanding how these work uh, with, uh, throughout the, the healing. And fibrin plays a very important role. First of all, it, it has a determining role in the platelet aggregation during hemostasis, and it acts as a, as a biological 3D network, like a scaffold where cell migration, proliferation, differentiation, and delivery of the growth factors happen. And we know from the research that the delivery of growth factors with the PRF uh, happens during the first 10 days. So it starts immediately. So it means that the neovascularization process starts immediately, and that's key when it comes to grafting. Leukocytes, right. Some people say that leukocytes are not important, but there's uh, research that supports that they're extremely important in grafting in the PRF. We do know that they have an anti-infectious action, we do know that they regulate the ability of biomaterials up to the new host environment. And we also know that macrophages supply a continuous source of chemotactic agents to stimulate fibrosis and angiogenesis. But what we also know is that monocytes and macrophages have been shown to produce osteogenic factors like BMP2 which plays a key role in bone metabolism. Uh, this obviously is something that is still, well, uh, you know, we, we're looking into all this and how uh, leukocytes uh, help uh, with the production of BMP2, but it is a fact. Now, I'm gonna go through the steps that I follow when I do bone grafts with allografts and PRF. I just wanted to show you two cases that can be done without having to harvest bone from the external oblique line, because that is something that some uh, colleagues don't feel comfortable doing. So there's an easier way. So you can see the titanium plate and the screws in place. Then allograft and PRF, sticky bone, which, is, uh, which fills the area. PRF membranes covering the whole thing. So as you can see, I don't use any collagen membranes or non-resorbable ones. And then suturing in two layers. Uh, the reason that I've shown this is because, and I have to apologize for that, the cases I'm gonna show you, I was taking pictures myself 
because I didn't have anyone to do it for me. So there's some steps of the uh, procedure that I didn't take pictures of. First case, 52 year old female, severe maxillary atrophy and impacted upper left canine. It's quite severe. And uh, I'm sure that Guy and Reese would say, oh, zygoma case. Yes, it could be a zygoma case, definitely. But uh, the patient um, was young-ish and she didn't want to go to zygoma. She preferred to, to go with bone grafts and normal implants, if I may call them normal. And as you can see, there's lots of bone missing in the posterior part. Now, even in, at the front where teeth are still there, there's not much bone and you can see the impacted cane on there. And the, the left side is not any better. Right, so um, this is how it looked when I did my incision and I removed the impacted canine. This is the upper right side, upper left side. My plate, titanium mesh is in place and um, I filled the area between the plate and the, the bone surface with allograft and PRF, and then I covered the area with membranes. Again, apologies for not having pictures of that. And this is three weeks post-operatively. You can see the stitches are still there. Soft tissue looks good. And this is the CBCT that I've done four months later. So you can see that there's plenty of good bone there horizontally and you can still and you can see my screws in the plate there and this is the CBCT scan um, you will be able to see now the amount of bone we have in the area compared to what we had before Right, so then uh, we opened again, removed the hardware, placed four implants. On second thought, now that I see this case, I would probably be better off uh, placing another implant maybe. But back then it seemed okay. Patient was a, a female patient, you know, small structure, small jaws and everything. So I thought four is okay, still okay, actually the patient today. And now you can see um, the one on the upper left x-ray uh, is before we started with the impacted canine. This one in the middle is four months later. And this is uh, three or four months after placing, removing the hardware and placing the implants. And you can see now on the CBCT, the amount of bone I have for each implant. This is the distal one on the right. This is uh, the one, the anterior right side, anterior left side, and distal left. Not bad. And we started from this and we ended up here. This case was uh, loaded immediately uh, because I could engage the implants into good basal bone and the patient was very happy. This is the temporary uh, bridge in place. Second case, 44 year old female, full dentures, unsuccessfully treated with allogenic blow graft in the anterior maxilla and xenograft in the posterior max maxilla by another practitioner. And she was referred to me to see what I can do. Uh, this is what I saw when I opened. Uh, in the circles here, you can see there's a uh, allograft with some sort of tissue. It was mushy uh, and it was removed. And the two screws here where they were used to fix the block graft. This is the X-ray. Again, it's a case of possibly uh, uh, pterygoids or zygomas combination but she was 44, I didn't want to go that route. 
when I removed everything, this is what I ended up with. Now, this device is something that I, I did myself. It's made of titanium foil. Uh, and uh, I use them as space maintenance devices. And there's a screw on the palatal and on the buckle for each one of them. And once these were fixed, I placed four of them. The fourth one is distally here, and you cannot see it. Uh, the areas here were filled with allograft and PRF sticky bone, and everything was covered with uh, PRF membranes. And now you will be able to appreciate the, the, the bone that I received. You can see it here. All right, so four months later, when I opened up, you can see that there's plenty of good bone there. I removed the, the hardware and you can see the difference between when we started and when four months later, six implants were placed. Sticky bone again, buccally, because I always want to try and, and have as much bone buccally as possible. And this is the X-ray and the immediate loading uh, bridge. Now, in summary, uh, I always consider reconstruction in younger patients instead of zygomas, which are kept as the ace up my sleeve if things don't work out. For successful outcomes, um, I believe that we have to incorporate many little things together into our recipe. So you have to follow the same sort of thinking and philosophy if you want to achieve good results. You cannot go and try, for example, biomaterials that we know will not work. As I said earlier, neovascularization is key. If no blood vessels, no viable bone, even if we're talking about uh, autogenous grafts, we do know that if there's, the, uh, there's no neovascularization from the very beginning, from the early stages, we tend to lose more of that bone uh, at the end. Now, I don't know if I should call them take home tips or keep at home because we're all at home at the moment. But uh, careful selection of biomaterials is very important. For me, graft and PRF or autogenous bone are the way to go. Remember that we graft outside the bony envelope, so uh, there's not much of an option there when it comes to biomaterials. The incision has to be planned very carefully. The extensive release is extremely important, but at the same time, it has to be done in an atraumatic way. And space maintenance uh, is very important as well. Um, the way I do it, as you saw, is titanium mesh or cortical plates. There are other ways too. And you always have to think of blood supply and neovascularization. No blood supply or delayed neovascularization in means results that are below our ex way below our expectations. Thank you very much and stay healthy. And my email is there if anyone has any questions at whenever in the future as well, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Liesl Miller speaking from Southern. Um, I'm going to go through some questions and open it up to the panel to answer. Uh, Guy, I see, I see you've answered some questions in the panel. So, so Riz, this one's for you. For the nasal implant, do you elevate the nasal mucosa? In lateral nasal wall, is this possible or impossible? It is possible. I think that's the way, to be honest with you, the nasal sinus is very thick. So the chance of perforation of the nasal sinus is, is very low. Um, by raising a large flap and uh, exposing, exposing the nasal sinus, lifting it up is, it's, we're only lifting up by a millimeter or two, but there's no risk of perforation doing that. It's very easy and it drops back quite nicely. I'd rather that 
then drill through it and actually perforate the nasal sinus because that's going to cause a lot of problems. Right, then Finn Basin asked, do, the, do you get prosthetic issues with the metal, metal acrylic hybrid prosthesis as shown in that lovely surgical case of yours? Um, no, we don't get any issues with that, to be honest with you. Having a, um, a metal, as a temporary, we obviously have an, just an acrylic temporary with a strengthener and the final bridge will always have a titanium framework with a wraparound. Generally speaking, we don't have any issues. And to be honest with you, depending on the type of a restoration that you want to use, long term and bearing in mind some of the patients have been going around for uh, 15 years with these prostheses, we don't tend to have problems. If they do, the good thing about having an immediate temporary is that we can, uh, we can remove the final prosthesis, change it to the temporary prosthesis and always get it repaired. That's the beauty of acrylic. Uh, most of the patients like that. Obviously some patients like different uh, materials which are, can either be the ceramic, the zirconia, the ceramic historically used to be very expensive, which is the, what you can call the modified Peter Worley, which is the individual crowns, um, which is fine because if something broke, you could replace it. But if it was all ceramic and it broke, then you, you, you're into, into problems. A lot of them now are zirconia based, which full zirconia, which doesn't have any issues and can be printed very quickly. Then um, is a nasal bleed one of the intraoperative complications when raising the nasal floor? No, I haven't come across a complication like that. Um, to be honest with you, if we're like, uh, as I said before, if we're raising that, that uh, nasal area, it's a very minimal raise. So if there was a blade, you could see it at the time. Um, obviously there's vessels around, but to be honest with you, it's around the nasal sinus area. No, I've not seen it and I don't anticipate any problems there. It's a very easy thing to do with minimal complications. Um, may, may I add that most of the blood vessels are concentrated in the septal part of the nasal cavity. So you don't have major uh, bleeders in that site. And then the mucosa is quite thick. And it's much easier to go under the periosteum compared to, for example, uh, the, the sinus floor, which is much thinner and much more fragile. Yeah, agreed. That's, that's the, the biggest thing there is, as, as Stavros said, is the thicker membrane. So lifting it up, is, it's, if you can do sinus grafting and you lift the sinus membrane, that's more fragile. As you know, with uh, people who are smokers, they tend to be a thicker, thicker membrane. But compared to the nasal sinus, it's a lot, lot thicker. So never perforated, I, I find it very difficult unless you're being very aggressive. Just a gentle lift and it's very easy. Yeah. Okay, and I, I just add to that as well, that um, on our scans, we very often pick up um, uh, sort of little aberrant vessels around that area. So the nasal canalis uh, is in, in around that region. Uh, so in theory, when you drill, you could get a bleed from that. Um, and uh, essentially, if you do get a bleed, you're going to plug it with, a, with the implant. So uh, this stops the, the bleeding. Some people have reported uh, excessive nasal pain from around this, this region. Um, so again, that, that can be an issue. And I've had a couple of patients with nasalis that have had some ongoing pain lasting for three or four months. In general, they've settled. Um, and then the other final thing is what Riz was pointing out in terms of your positioning of your implant. With your apex of your nasalis, you don't want to go too high because you start getting close towards your nasolacrimal duct, uh, which is just a little bit higher up. So in theory, with some inflammation around the mucosa, you could get some obstruction of your nasolacrimal duct uh, if you went very high. So in other words, what we do is we like to expose the nasal floor, which takes literally seconds to do. Uh, you don't want to perforate through into the, through the nasal mucosa because the different bacteria that you have within the nasal cavity, you don't want to drag that through into your wound. Um, and again, just to keep everything nicely positioned so you can see exactly where you're going. Don't, don't put the implant really high. Don't go too high. So go on just on the reflection round uh, as you get the curvature of, um, of the nasal floor. If you want to just go in that little curvature area just here. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the key point there, is to expose everything and see it. And this is what we talk about, whether you're doing the zygomas or whether you're doing nasalis, is to actually visualize where you're going. I think blind drilling is obviously going to be a problem. And angulation, as you said, I think that's very important. Yeah. Right, um, any special precautions with the use of nasalis implants? For example, we know that air flosser devices should not be used for zygomatic implants due to possible emphysema. Does this apply to for nasalis? 
No, I don't think there's any special precautions with that. I think initially, obviously, with any initial surgery, initial bridge, we don't recommend that. Whether it's going to be a standard all on four or whether it's going to be a nasalis, we don't use uh, any air floss or any air pressure there. But after the healing process of three to four months, because you've got bone that's sealing it, um, both on the crestal side and also towards the nasal side of it, where you've put a bone graft there, I don't anticipate it, but I don't see any problems and I don't recommend anything different. But uh, an air floss is absolutely fine. Okay. Yeah, and I'd, I'd agree. I think um, essentially with all on fours, we use uh, water pick from uh, six weeks um, and we're happy for, for the use of that. With nasalis and with zygomas, uh, again, I, I wouldn't use them. Uh, the only exception would be is that when you come to your one yearly CT scan and you can see you've got good thick amounts of bone, like some of the cases I showed, around, around the implants. I think at that stage, I would be happy to say that you could use a water pick. But in general, if you're placing without grafting, uh, using a water pick could damage um, that very s small amount of connective tissue uh, that you have between the oral cavity and the sinus cavity. So in other words, you've got to know what type of implant you've placed and how you've placed it. So technique definitely does become important. So that, that would be my take home. So in, in general for nasalis and zygomas, I wouldn't use a water pick and I wouldn't use an air flosser. Uh, however, if at one year you were happy with a bone around the implant, then you could consider using it. Patients certainly like them and they get on very well with them. So the standard cleaning is much better. Yeah. In um, patients with dentures are used to having high lip support from the denture plunge. Do they accept the lack of high lip support at the end of the treatment with a fixed implant bridge? Well, in these cases, I think uh, it's important to consider grafting that area to replace the volume that uh, the flanges were giving to the lip to support it. That's one way to see it, but uh, sometimes it's not possible to reproduce exactly what was uh, produced by, by the, the effect of the acrylic material that you had there to support the lips. So it I think it depends on each case individually, uh, how important it is. Definitely, I think pre-diagnosis here is really important. So um, the majority of lip support comes from the cervical uh, one third of the tooth. So providing you're putting the tooth in the right position, whether whatever fixed uh, structure you've got, you're gonna get adequate lip support. And the way to prove that to the patient is to essentially make a copy denture, uh, and then you remove the flange of the copy denture and you assess the lip support. And providing the teeth in the right place, most people have adequate lip support. Um, we, we find we very rarely need to get any extra lip support other than get the teeth in the right place. If the teeth are set too far back or um, too high, then you, you lose the lip support. So uh, tooth position is important. So again, it's a, uh, a prosthetic uh, um, decision. Really. Yeah, and also it's telling the patient when you're doing this, inevitably when we see these patients who have got failing periodontally involved teeth, they can be protruded and therefore they have more limb support than they need. So therefore, when we're bringing the teeth back to the right position, the lip is going to drop, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's going to bring it back to where it should originally be. So it's worth telling the patient, having that conversation with the patient. Yeah. Right, this is from Pietro um, in Italy. He says, um, so Riz, are you going to consider Nazala's technique as an alternative to zygomatic? or patient selection criteria must thoroughly be considered on, on each planning case? I think when I take each case as an individual case, I don't think it's an alternative. I think zygomas have their own place and I do a lot of zygoma, zygoma implants. Um, but my go-to, the reason why nasalis I think is a good interim or a good alternative, not necessarily just if we have a case, do I decide does it go to zygoma or does it go to nasalis? It depends on the thickness of the bone. It depends on whether I can achieve, because bearing in mind, most of our cases are immediate load. Now, if I'm going to place a nasalis, the reason why I look at that is to see, have I got enough cortical bone? And what I mean by that is two to three millimeters of bone height. Do I have then have a, a good sinus, which is a rounded sinus that I can go through and engage up into the nasal bone? Um, and also the thickness of the bone as well. If the bone is very thin straight away, I can't consider that rules out nasalis. So, I think Guy would agree with me on that, that if yeah. we can get away with a nasalis implant, 
where we have the right criteria, which is the thickness of the bone, the good bone height, and a favorable sinus, absolutely, I think that I would prefer that to then go to zygoma. Zygoma then only comes in when I look at the scan, so I'll take it on an individual basis. If the bone is very thin, and I know I'm not, I have to do some grafting, which the patient doesn't require, we've been doing the medium load, and, uh, and I can get a good AP spread, then absolutely I'll go for zygoma. So it's not necessarily one or the other, it's a treatment that I go either standard all in four, nasalis or zygoma. That's what I consider depending on the patient, the age, and also the anatomy. Yeah, that's, Riz, that's a correct answer, I think. And it's, it's about having a, uh, a bag of different tricks so that you can try and uh, treat every solution that's um, presented to you with the patient. So, yeah, some, some patients may be nasalis, some may be zygoma, some may be pterygoids, some may be all in four but it's having the ability to do the different treatments uh, in order to be able to provide that um, same day fix to. Exactly, and, and again, like I showed before, is that you could do a hybrid case just because you're doing zygoma on one side because of the anatomy, yeah. the other side would be a nasalis. So it could be a mixed bag. And that's why having these techniques at hand means that we can then alternate or change between, between different sides. Um, how important is the irrigation when drilling on the zygoma and how do you think is the best way to do it so you um uh yeah i'll answer you, you saw how i do it so i have the uh, irrigation tube separately in my in my other hand uh i do think it's really important uh, so you don't want to overheat the bone in the zygoma uh the other thing which i didn't particularly show is that um uh, you'll see that when i raised up the bone um so it rose up the periosteum behind the back of the zygoma, so it wasn't going to traumatize the tissue. Uh, I think that's really important to lift up there. People said don't lift up the, the, the um, periosteum around the back there. It creates more swelling, it creates more discomfort. However, if you push through some burnt bone chips and they're sitting there, I think that could potentially be an issue. So what I'll do is extensively wash through the osteotomy site in the zygoma, initially just with... Uh, um, uh, sterile saline uh, and also I'll then use the liquid from the PRGF to wash through there as well so I don't want any little bone fragments sitting there or any burnt bone fragments sitting there uh, and I think that's that's really important now does that make a difference most of the time probably not but like all these things it's sort of like you know, that marginal gain theory of, of trying to do lots of little things that all end up in giving you a better sort of final final end result so um, yeah, if you've got someone there also, again, giving external irrigation uh, with normal saline, it gives me another spare hand. I've, I've adapted a technique that I don't necessarily need someone to do that, but, you know, uh, if you've got more hands there, it certainly makes it easier for you. So, yeah, I would agree with that. It is yeah, important. I, I, I agree with the, the washing out as well, because washing those bone fragments up, I've had cases where the patients have come back with a bit of irritation or swelling. Uh, subsided, but it's taken a while, and I think that's probably due to the fact that it hasn't been washed out. So I agree with that. So that applies to every case when we do bone surgery, orthopedics, maxillofacial, or oral surgery. You have to irrigate. Make sure that you're dealing with clean surfaces, and there's no any you know bone chips here and there. But it also helps uh, with the, uh, making sure that there is no you don't uh, you know uh, raise the temperature as well. So. Is it, is it, what, what Guy says, adding small things and ending up with a much better result, that, that's key, I think. Yeah, it, it, wasn't my, it wasn't my idea, it was Team Sky, actually. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> Marginal gains. <laughs> David <Right>. Brailsford. <laughs> mm. Guy, would you recommend the incision line on the buckle site with tissue for standard all on four technique or just when sinus surgery is involved? So if you're lucky to have an, uh, a dentulous um, case uh, for all on four, uh, then I would definitely do it uh, on, on the buckle side. Um, for all on four, the risk you have with zygomas about doing the, the high vestibular incision is, is one, during the incision you can get some bleeding. So uh, you need to be uh, aware and uh, treat lots of local anaesthetic in there and then do proper closure afterwards. Uh, the other issue you have is potential wound breakdown and exposure of the, the implant. Now, as you see, what, why, what I showed is that I'm going to graft around my implants, I'm going to put a membrane around my implants, I'm then going to do horizontal mattress sutures, I'm going to do individual sutures. 
all to try and uh, negate that risk around zygomas. However, with um, standard oil and pore, if you were to get a little bit of wound breakdown right up in the buccal area there, it makes no difference because it doesn't expose the implant. Uh, the implant should be within bone unless you're grafted, but again, that's not maybe true all on four. So in actual fact, with all on four, it's, it, that's where I initially got the treatment uh, concepts from and then just adapted it more for, for zygomas. It makes uh, impression taking really beautiful. Um, so you don't get everything tangled up in the stitches. Uh, it also just gives a, uh, a nice sort of cratinized uh, ring of tissue all around your implants, which is exceptionally important in, in all on four as well as in zygomas. And the distal implants that are placed on all on floor, I'm always going to place slightly on the palatal aspect of the, of the ridge as well, because uh, thin, um, uh, non cratinized tissue around any implant is, is a real issue. Now, on those distal implants on all on four, it can happen. And then once you get some exposure of a rough implant surface, I think you're in trouble, which again, hence why I say things like the, the MSC is a particularly good implant, because if we have some exposure to that implant, we can still manage it and we can take care of the implant. So yeah, for all and four, definitely vestibular incision, far less risk involved with, um, with, and you can just stitch it normally. You don't need to do all this extensive stitching that I've done. Um, if you do it for zygomas, we just, and it's the same with bone grafting, we just don't want any wound breakdown of these sites because you'll, you'll lose graft. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. Right, and then just a, a, a question for a book suggestion for zygoma implants. Uh, just one book out there, no? <laughs> <laughs> Your favourite. Hold, hold Car that one up. Carlos Aparicio, yeah. I don't know if people can see that. Mm. Oh, always by my bedside, that one. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so... So Zygomatic Implants, Carlos Aparicio is, is the best book, it's a brilliant book. Great. Um, Stavros, please explain your horizontal mattress suture in detail if you can. If you would. Uh, yeah, I can, I can uh, share the, the, the drawing that I have, if that's going to help. Let me just uh, find it. <laughs> yeah. Let me just show my screen now for a moment. So um, what I do, I start from the buccal side, deep into the vestibule, I enter, and then I go to the lingual or palatal side, and then I, turn, I return back by entering again from the lingual or palatal and exiting again deep into the vestibule in, on the buccal side. And that's the suture that holds all the tension and allows me to have a closure of the flap without any uh, tension. I hope that helps. If there's any more that you need me to say or explain, please let me know. Okay. Um, in terms of positioning the fast plates, how far do you position from the intended junction between crestal bone and buccal bone? In other words, how far coronally, apically? Coronal well, uh, you have to be more crestally rather than you know uh, coronally because you want to have as you know a, a thick bone as much as possible towards the crest well sometimes that's a bit tricky uh, but uh, through experience i've realized that it's much more important to keep it higher rather than lower uh, based i mean from the crest yeah so i try to keep it nearer to the crest if possible. Okay. Are there any serious studies which prove that allograft or xenograft in horizontal and vertical reconstructions is a reliable and reproducible technique with high implant survival and success rate? Serious? Mm. I don't know what we mean by serious, but uh, I mean, we have the results that show what's going on. It's not just me. Let's start from... Uh, the Curie technique, which is basically autogenous bone. And nobody can deny that autogenous is the gold standard. And Curie doesn't use uh, any, anything else other than autogenous graft. Then when it comes to allografts, we know that allografts are the next best thing after autogenous graft. They turn into bone at a much uh, higher percentage. And if you go back in and take a, a, a biopsy, years later you won't find 
uh, loads of remnants from that material. Whereas with xenografts, even after 20 years, there's a paper out there, they, they did a biopsy in the sinus, and the, the, there was a huge percentage of uh, xenograft particles in there. Xenograft is a material where the body encapsulates when it creates bone. And um, it's, there's a big percentage of that in the, in, the, in the graft. And then if we have any inflammation in the area or infection, it, it ends up in a very, very bad situation. Uh, whereas with allografts, we've seen it, we know the, the, the material turns into bone and um, the outcome is much better. The quality is much better because lots of people nowadays think about the volume. It's not just the volume, the amount of material we have, it's the quality, the quality. And whatever, we, whatever we're trying to, to do is to, to get as much of a better quality uh, crafting material and, and res ending up in good bone material that will hold implants. And we, we, we have tried many things, at least in my hands, Xenograft is not the, 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 the material of choice. And even uh, people like uh, Urban, they combine that with autogenous. Otherwise, on its own, it would never, ever work. Okay. Um, Stavros, what pre and post-op medication do you prescribe for these bone graft reconstruction surgeries? Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to make sure that uh, my patient's vitamin D level is good and I try to persuade them to take a, a, a vitamin D for uh, at least uh, three months from the day of surgery or even start before, ideally. Uh, good oral hygiene to start with and some basic antibiotics like amoxicillin, the same way we approach any full arch case, for example. Uh, I sometimes prescribe uh, steroids just to reduce the amount of swelling and when it comes to painkillers, uh, painkillers that I usually use for my uh, regular cases, implant cases like uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatories and paracetamol. And good oral hygiene, of course. Thank you. Um, and how do you temporize the case during the bone graft healing? So as I said uh, earlier in my presentation, if I can avoid having any temporaries, I prefer so. If I have to use the temporaries, I would either go with uh, four abutments and spread throughout the arch. Those four abutments would either be teeth that I sometimes have and I can temporarily use, or there's provisional implants that can be placed and those can be used to uh, fit a temporary bridge on top, or you can go with a dentro with no flanges and if uh, patients want something a bit more stable, you can always put a, a small implant in the mid palate with a locator abutment or something similar that would hold that in place. But I would make sure that there is no pressure or com on my uh, grafted areas. Okay. Then um, the first, first of your cases, Stavros, the loading was done, done after how many months of implant placement? Immediately. Immediately. Both cases were loaded immediately because I could engage uh, my implants into basal bone that gave me high, good uh, uh, primary stability. Insertion talks were higher than 35 uh, newtons per square centimeter. So I managed to do that immediately. But in some cases, it's not possible. And it's very important to be able to engage the basal bone. Otherwise, it's better to uh, avoid that and wait for at least three months after the implant placement. Okay, thank you. Um, Guy, how do you manage the perforation of the sinus lining during zygoma implant placement? Uh, yeah, good question actually. Um, so, uh, one, <laughs> uh, always the answer is gonna be if you can avoid it, that's better. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, careful elevation, as we've always said, uh, prevention is better than treatment. Uh, but for definite, it's going to happen. Uh, sometimes in trickier cases, uh, you may uh, make a bigger window, so it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, if I get a, a small perforation right out of the apex, in other words, where the apex of the implant is going to go into the 
uh, zy zygomatic bone from the underside. I wouldn't have any concerns about that at all. I wouldn't be bothered in any way. That would be fine. <laughs> if it's at the coronal section, and I was wanting to graft, and I had minimal amounts of um, uh, alveolar bone here, I think that definitely is more of an issue. Um, I tend to revert back to how I used to do things. So for, for that, I think if you start putting a particular biomaterial, um, anything into the area, I think you're gonna risk losing it straight out of the nose uh, in a few days. Um, so on those ones, I would then go back to just using PRGF. Um, so using both the membranes and the, the, the clot that you get from the, um, um, the, the first fraction of, of PRF, uh, PRGF. Um, and I would also, um, if I let the bone scrape and set in that so it forms like a gel. So I'd be happy putting that gel in around the area. But in general, um, uh, I would avoid uh, graft in that case. I suppose the same like doing a, a sinus tap or a sinus lift. You know, if you if you do a sinus lift and you can see you've got perforation of the, um, the sinus, would you still put an implant in? I would still put an implant in. Uh, would I graft that one? No, because it would just come out through the nose. Uh, and it's exactly the same. I think you know, try try and avoid. You know, be careful with your technique. Um, and again, I suppose I've done it an, an awful lot of these now. Uh, and the more you do, the better you get at them. Um, so it, it's similar to a science graft. You did a science graft and you tore the science lining, would you put the graft in? You, you probably wouldn't put the graft in. You may still put the implant in, but you may not put the graft in. So I suppose that would be my, my simple an answer is uh, technique and try and avoid. Thank you. Okay. Um, is retrieving an internally angled nasalis implant difficult if it develops problems? Um, well, that's always a question when it comes to coax implants. Um, whatever implant we're putting in, whether it's going to be an angled implant on the norm, normal or long floor and anterior, especially posterior. No, I've removed one before, like I said, and that was coming from my own case where I'd angled too high up. I think I didn't achieve proper primary stability. We immediately loaded. We had two parallel running together. The distal one had failed. Removing it. To be honest with you, it does take a wider angle to go around, but it's still retrievable because you're putting on a re removable screw, which, uh, for example, any company who's Southern, you can screw it back, turn it, and as you back turn it, it goes around in a large motion, but because it's a relatively small screw, you can still manage to go back and take it out. You can't obviously get in, um, for example, the onion that I like to use to put the my zygomas in, you have to use another tool, something that can engage the end, like a torque wrench, but it does come out, it just has to go around wider, that's all. But it is relatively easy. And bear in mind, if it has failed, if a problem is going to occur and it becomes loose, then it's generally easy just to pull out. Yeah, I agree. I say, really removing, fa removing failed implants is relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. I think the issue that we have is uh, removing uh, failed zygomas uh, because they often haven't failed to integrate apically. Uh, they all integrate in the zygoma. Um, but where we maybe have a failure is with the sinus, which is why I spent such a long time talking about lifting sinus out of the carefully out of the way, grafting the area, uh, making sure that we've got a, a long-term uh, solution for these patients. Because taking out a failed zygoma is very different, very difficult, because you often have to cut some bone up in the zygoma. Uh, in the past, we even had to section through the zygoma and uh, through the a zygoma implant and actually leave an apical portion there because I just couldn't get it out. You risk fracturing the zygoma, you, um, as in the, the patient's own zygoma, uh, which again could cause major complications. Uh, so it's very difficult to get uh, enough force to uh, derotate them. So a failed nasalis, uh, straightforward, a failed zygoma, a very different problem. Mm. Um, Stavros, have you had experience with CAD CAM design tie mesh from Germany? No, I haven't. Uh, but I prefer to adapt my uh, tie mesh or plate uh, during surgery based on what I see. Sometimes you have to uh, adjust slightly. And if it's, uh, you know, pre-made, it doesn't give you that uh, freedom. But I haven't tried the specific one. I wouldn't want to try something like that though because I always want to have the you know the flexibility of adjusting my hardware to how I want them to be. Thank you. Uh, if, if you want, I, I, um, 
I've, I've used the, it's quite a reasonable amount, the, um, the real system. I can uh, just show you a quick presentation. I'll just take two seconds just to show it very quickly. So let's see if I can just share, share, share that screen. Okay, I want to ask the next question while you're looking for that guy. Um, so up, yeah. How difficult or easy is it to remove the hardware components? Come again, please. How difficult or easy is it to remove the hardware components? I'm well, assuming... uh, yeah. Um, the most difficult part is to expose the, the um, screws uh, because there's sometimes fibrous tissue around it that makes it a bit more difficult to expose and you sometimes need to use a scalpel slowly slowly to uh, to dissect that but once you do that it's very easy to remove it from the bone surface has, has that come up now yes yeah. yep. no, i just i quickly show you that, uh this is obviously someone with um uh, extensive bone loss uh, distal to the the lower premolar there um, we're looking to place in a couple of implants. Uh, and this is how the real system comes in a, a 3D um, pre-planned packet with the drilling site. So again, raising flaps with a, um, a super mile higher flap to make sure we get good tension-free closure. Uh, this is with a combination of 50% uh, uh, autogenous, as in scape, safe scrape, mixed with BIOS and the BioGuide bio membrane placed over the top with a fixation screw distally. They really clip onto the bone really nicely. Uh, and then obviously the, the, the closure showing a nice tension-free closure. Um, then this is exposing, I think it was seven months, I went back into this. So leaving a mesh on in place while you drill through the, the sites for your uh, implants. Uh, and then you can sp split the titanium mesh and then remove the two sections. And then we can go ahead and place our implants. So you've got really nice, good stability with these implants and obviously then finally restored those ones. So, so that, that um, I've done quite a few cases now. Uh, it's been very easy to use. That took, uh, the, the placement of the grafts uh, took about less than 40 minutes, I think, with photos. So it was quite a, a straightforward, easy, easy thing to do actually, so. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you guys. Excellent presentation and really insightful patient options available. Question for Guy. What happens if you are unsuccessful in positioning the zygoma into the extra sinus position and say you perforate the sinus, would you proceed to abort if the implant is in the sinus, which means you cannot do the sandwich? Uh, I'll still place the, the implants. The sandwich is a relatively new uh, technique for me because um, what I'm trying to do is create bone all the way around the implant. Um, I've probably done over, I guess, six, seven hundred implants with, without any, um, I wouldn't say care for the sinus lining, but uh, just placing the implants straight straight through. Um, and I've, I've had problems, um, but there's also a, a huge amount where we, where we didn't have problems. So um, I would, um, uh, it, it always depends on your, your positioning, um, but yes, I'd still be happy to place the implant. Uh, um, sometimes you may not get stability with some of these narrow apex implants, in which case I also keep a, a collection of uh, conventional um, uh, zygomatic implants, as uh, Zygoma 55. Uh, and if I don't get stability, I'll just take that one out and then replace it with another one because we're always trying to get stability in order to get our immediate load. So that sometimes can happen. Um, but yes, I'd still be happy to place. Thank you. How do you judge the angulation of your zygoma and azalis osteotomy to ensure your angle corrected implant heads will be at the right angulation for restoration? Um, well, for nasalis and zygomas as well, I think the most important thing there is, first of all, with the CT scan, you know, kind of generally get your outline of where you're going to place your zygoma or nasalis. Um, secondly, it's all visual, so we're reflecting the flap, a large enough flap. Um, as Guy said, when we're doing zygomas, when I do zygomas, I create a large enough window. I can follow the low border of the zygoma there and I can go and actually look from where I want to be project. So it's more like a visual, we don't use um, 
guided surgery. It's more You've got visual. prosthetic stent. Prosthetic so we have a prosthetic stent to give us where we're going to go, but also we can have a look and see where we want to be. So, for example, the naked artist, as you've seen, I've created a window so I can probe where my anterior border of my uh, sinus is. I've done the nasal sinus as well. So from that point onwards, I can visualize, I score the sinus, I score the area that I want to lift the sinus out, push the sinus back, and it's easy to visualize. And same, same with zygomas. It's actually visualizing for me is the key for both techniques. Yeah, I agree. Um, Stavros, why not using block or 3D structure bone graft instead of granules in this maxillary case? Um, first of all, uh, if I use a block graft, I, it will be very difficult for the body to uh, give enough blood supply for the whole block graft to be able to retain the whole thing and uh, turn it into uh, bone. So part of it will be resolved because it will never be uh, receive good blood supply. Number two, I won't be able to mix that the way I want it to be mixed with my PRF, which is key because the PRF, as I said, releases growth factors for 10 days immediately after the surgery. And that's one of the reasons why I can do these uh, procedures using allografts. Otherwise, it would be impossible. It would only be possible to do them uh, successfully with autogenous grafts. Thank you. Um, from Dr. Greg Boyce Varley, hi all, fantastic presentations, great cases and treatment protocols. Please may I ask both Riz and Guy a question. How often do you have a split mouth technique with a zygoma implant on one side and a zolus on the other? I think it's more common now that we have got the implants to go both ways. Um, I agree. Um, for Greg, I agree. I mean, obviously, um, seeing him doing a lot of zygomatic implants and how we were with the four nasalis came along. I think with the range of implants that we have, um, I think it gives us now a good idea that when we see a patient, split mouth is becoming more common. Um, I wouldn't say, generally speaking, we do do a lot more. I'm doing zygoma, I do zygoma, but having a look like I've shown you hybrid cases, that is becoming more common. A, because I feel more confident doing the nasalis implant. And I think that's down to me doing enough of these nasalis implants over the last few years to say I can get predictable results. Um, and so therefore, again, like, like we talked about earlier, if I can do a nasalis and get away with that and we get good stability, that would be my first line of choice. But yes, definitely split mouth has become more common um, simply because I think we have the implants that are suited now for every sort of technique. I think it's, uh, it's a great question from Greg and I think uh, I know from having chatted with him many times that uh, probably in the past, uh, you know, a lot of cases got zygomas for him uh, that, that weren't zygoma cases nowadays. And we're placing angled implants with much more predictability, whether it be uh, just more, more complex all on fours with um, coaxis, whether it be uh, the use of nasalis or pterygoids. So uh, I think more and more we're seeing hybrids. The, the one thing I would just add, add in in terms of uh, the zygoma one uh, for conventional all on fours is it works as a great rescue implant. Uh, so uh, if we're gonna lose an implant, it's often that distal implant um, into maybe poor bone, because as we go further back in the maxilla, the, the bone gets worse. Uh, anterior ones, we're normally able to get stability by engaging into the nasal floor. Whereas sometimes uh, the distal implant, we don't get fantastic stability and the bone may be quite thin and we just push the envelope a little bit. Now I think in those cases, uh, and it always happens during the temporary phase, so during those first three to four months, we may consider taking out a distal implant and then using a zygoma as a, as a rescue implant. So I think uh, more and more, both in, in rescue for our own cases, and perhaps even, you know, there's going to be uh, revisional all on four work that's going to be required. So revisional all on four work is definitely going to require pterygoids, zygomas, nasalis. So uh, again, I think as a, as a rescue and also as a, a future, as we see more and more atrophic patients, some atrophic through the patients being atrophic, or some being iatrogenically atrophic. In other words, what we've done uh, as, as dentists, as surgeons, and we, you know, we all have our failures for definite. So I think it's a, it's a great question from Greg, and I'm sure he, he's doing many more hybrid cases than he was beforehand, whereas many, many of them would be psychomas. So I'm, I'm sure he, he'd say the same. But also in a point, I think when we do consent, 
patient for nasalis, I also consent the patient for zygoma. So there's always got to be that rescue or that, that, that um, knowledge of doing a zygoma. If you're going to go nasalis, you're going through the whole procedure of doing a full arch. I always consent my patients for both. So if I do, and if I don't achieve prime stability, I know I can go to a zygoma. Yeah, it's either that or you have to consent them for a denture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Always do my first line. Yeah. <laughs> the, the next question actually follows on from that one. It says, um, do you see more prosthetic problems in a hybrid zygoma case compared to a quad zygoma case due to the difference in mobility between the zygoma implants and the stand standard implants? Quad zygoma is a, is a more, is a totally different animal, I have to say. Um, the hybrid zygoma case uh, in general becomes very much more like a, a standard all on, all on four. Uh, a quad zygoma we're often doing because we have virtually no or limited um, uh, bone, uh, alveolar bone at all. Um, so uh, it's not really uh, been in the scope of this talk to talk about quad zygomas because it's very different and without doubt you get movement. Uh, I think uh, Dale Howes gave a very good talk um, at the uh, zygomatic conference uh, last year and he was saying the importance uh, when you have implants like zygomas where you might have a little bit of flex on mobility as the, the maxilla moves and flexes uh, you want as rigid a structure as possible connecting your implants uh, whether that's in the temporary phase where you decide to put something like metal strengthener or easy bar or whatever you use to your final bridge work and that would probably support the fact that uh, using a, a monolithic uh, zirconia um, so um, uh, bridge would probably be the strongest that we have and the most rigid. And so um, for that reason, all of our uh, zygoma cases and uh, probably about 95% of our all on four now, they all get um, pretal bridges. So the zircon zahn system. And uh, I think we've done uh, over, over several hundred now uh, with, with very few problems. So I think you know, Linking things up rigidly is probably very important. Uh, I think if you're getting flex, you're going to obviously get uh, bits breaking off, whether it be acrylic teeth or whether it be um, um, por porcelain crowns on whirly bridges. So I think trying to get something as rigid as possible is probably what the data would suggest. I'm no prosthodontist, but uh, as I say, Dale Howes gave a, a fantastic presentation on that uh, at the Zyg Zygomatic Conference. Right, second to last question. Um, what's the minimum torque for zygoma implants for immediate load as you are doing cross arch stabilization? Min minimum torque. So, gosh, it's very rare the you know, uh, you get less than 35, very, very rare. Uh, I talked about uh, earlier if I didn't get stability with a narrow apex, how I, I change it and I put a wider implant in, a regular implant in. Um, you know, I, th I think figures are normally 60, 70, 80 Newton centimeters, maybe more. Um, if I didn't get good stability in maybe a zygoma uh, and uh, I got good stability in two anteriors and whatever was on the other side. So in other words, the cumulative effect of, of stability of the implants throughout the arch, um, you're going to link them together by uh, rigid cross arch stability. And I'd be happy at 20. I'd, I'd still do it, providing good, good stability in the others. But to be honest, that happens, you know, maybe once a year. I do it a couple of cases a week. So uh, it, it's a very rare situation. And maybe I'll push the boundaries and, you know, it still works. Every now and again, we get a failure to integrate. But gosh, it's rare. It's very rare. So the last question isn't strictly on topic, but it is from um, how do you, um, oh, where is it gone? How do you anticipate controlling aerosols post-coronavirus? That's definitely for Stavros. What's that? What's that? What's that? Come again? Oh, sorry. Stavros, I was in... How are yes. you going? How do you anticipate controlling aerosols post coronavirus? Oh, right. Now, I, all of a sudden, I've become a, a, a specialist. Well, first of all, uh, I don't use any aerosols in, in, in my surgery. So, I, I don't do any general dentistry. I don't use aerosols. So, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask and answer that question. <laughs> there, there is a suction unit, isn't there, that you can have an extra suction unit for removal of aerosolization. But, you know, again, um, we, we worked right up until the very last because uh, 
in uh, in Cardiff, we are following the Welsh guidelines, which are saying about avoidance of aerosol aerosolization, which technically by doing implants, we're, we're not uh, uh, using any aerotor instruments. So, so we carried on and, until everything was finally stopped. Um, so I don't know, I wonder whether we'll start earlier or not than general dentistry, but we'll fall into the uh, elective non-essential category. So I've got a feeling we may be the last to start. Yeah, I think we'll just be doing emergencies and I think it will, as we go back, obviously it's going to take a while, but hopefully when we do get back, um, stricter controls of how we protect ourselves. But as Guy said, um, you know, we're not strictly using aerosols. We're going to be using, we can use uh, slow drill protocols. Um, there are ways to do it without creating any, uh, any sort of aerosols around. But again, I think, as Guy said, and I'm expecting to be kind of the last group of people within the dental world to go back, unless there's emergencies, but let's see how it goes. And hopefully we'll be back to work soon. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone who attended this webinar. Thank you, Stavros and Riz and Guy, for your time this afternoon. Much appreciated. Have a good thank evening. Thank you too, Lisa, as thank well. For you, thank you very much for organizing and thanks everybody for joining. Stay safe and hopefully we'll be back drilling and placing implants. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> I hope very soon. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay, thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.